When looking at results from meta-analyses or performing a meta-analysis yourself, you will often see plots that look similar to this. This is known as a forest plot, and in this video I'll explain what a forest plot is and describe the different components of the plot by using an example so that it is easier to understand. But before I jump into this tutorial, just a little plug to say if you find this video useful, then please hit that like button. This way, if I see people want to see more videos around meta-analyses, then I can make some more. And if you want to stick around for more weekly tutorials, then consider subscribing to the channel. With that out of the way, let's begin. So what is a forest plot? A forest plot is a figure frequently used in meta-analyses which displays the results from a meta-analysis. Here is an example of a forest plot. Specifically, this meta-analysis combines studies that measured the amount of a certain protein in the brains of two groups, group 1 and group 2. Now, instead of diving headfirst into the whole plot, let me now remove everything so that I can easily break down the different components. The far left of the table will likely show the study name and year it was published. This is usually the first author's surname. Here, for this example, I just have study 1, 2, 3, etc. with a made up year. Each row in the plot contains the data from a different study. Next to the study name, you will often find more detailed information about that study. For example, I just have information about the number of participants in group 1 and group 2 from each of the studies. Now let's focus on the actual plot. This is where the effect sizes from individual studies are shown, usually as a circle or a square. In this example, I have squares. So let me now add the effect size for study 1. But what does this square actually mean? In meta-analyses, there can be different types of effect sizes, such as dichotomous, continuous or ordinal data. Common examples you will most likely see in meta-analyses are odds ratios, hazard ratios, mean difference or standardized mean difference. In this example, the effect size is the standardized mean difference. I know this is the case because the label on the axes states standardized mean difference and the abbreviation SMD is quoted at the top. More specifically, the standardized mean difference in this example is the standardized mean difference between our measure, the concentration of the protein, in the brains of group 1 and group 2. For study 1, this value is 0.11. You will also see horizontal lines either side of the effect size. These are the 95% confidence intervals. Usually, the wider the confidence intervals, as demonstrated by the wider lines, the less precision the study has compared to those with narrower confidence intervals. Revealing the 95% confidence intervals for study 1 shows that they range from negative 0.64 to positive 0.87. As well as these results being graphically displayed on the forest plot, they are almost always shown in numeric form on the far right side of the figure. Let me now reveal the rest of the data for the other studies. Now, one thought that may come into your head at this point is, why are some of the squares bigger than others? For example, just look at the square for study 4, and how much larger this is than the rest. Well, this is because the size of the square representing each effect size is proportional to its weight in the analysis. And I'll go on to talking about study weights shortly. Since a meta-analysis pools the results of the individual studies, the pooled summary effect and its 95% confidence intervals are shown at the bottom of the plot. In this case, it is a diamond and not a square, with the middle point representing the pooled effect size and the points either side representing the pooled 95% confidence intervals. Again, these results are also numerically displayed. Another feature you will often see in forest plots is the line of no effect. This is a vertical line, usually dotted, that passes through the position where there is no clear difference between the two experimental groups. For effect sizes based on differences, as is the case in this example, the line of no effect passes through zero. However, when the effect size is a ratio, such as an odds ratio or a hazard ratio, the line of no effect passes through 1. So what is the actual point of this line? It's actually really useful when interpreting the results. If the 95% confidence intervals of the individual studies 
as well as the pulled result, overlap with the line of no effect, then the results are not significant. In other words, the p-value is greater than 0.05 in this instance. I can easily see that the 95% confidence intervals for studies 1, 3, 4 and 6 cross the line of no effect, so these studies individually were not significant. However, if the 95% confidence intervals do not cross the line of no effect, as shown in studies 2 and 5, then the results of these individual studies are significant, so the p-value will be less than 0.05. This is also the case for the pooled result, since the diamond does not cross the line. If you're wondering about the direction of the effect size relative to the line of no effect, in other words, how to interpret the results if they are either on the right or the left side of the line of no effect, this all depends on how the effect sizes were calculated. In this example, anything to the right of the line of no effect means that it favours group 2 compared with group 1. On the other hand, if the results were to the left of the line, this means that it favoured group 1 compared to group 2. Most of the time, you will see a column known as weight. This is a percentage value that indicates how much influence the individual study has on the overall effect. There is a relationship between a study's weight and precision. So those with a relatively good precision, such as study 4, are assigned more weight compared with those with relatively poor precision, such as study 2. And since precision is largely driven by sample size, you will also notice that those studies with higher weights generally have a higher sample size compared with studies of a smaller sample size. And this links back to the observation of seeing different size squares in the plot. Notice those studies with larger weights have a larger square compared with those with smaller weights. After performing the meta-analysis, the summary effect is calculated. I can see in this example that the summary effect is 0.44 and the 95% confidence intervals are 0.13 and 0.76. Since the confidence intervals do not cross the line of no effect, we can conclude that the overall effect is significant. To understand the summary effect more, there are often summary statistics reported. In this example, since the effect sizes are standardised mean difference values, the z-statistic is reported. This value is used to determine the p-value for hypothesis testing. In this case, the p-value is 0.005, which is obviously lower than my alpha level of 0.05. So, the summary effect is statistically significant. Another aspect you should be aware of when interpreting forest plots and meta-analyses results is the model used to determine the summary effect. There are two types of models, a fixed effects model and a random effects model. The difference between the models goes beyond the scope of this video, but essentially they differ in the way they assign weights to the individual studies and ultimately change how the summary effect is calculated. In this example, a random effects model was used, and this is noted in the corner of the plot. If a fixed effects model was used, you would commonly see an abbreviation FE here instead. Let me briefly talk to you about study heterogeneity. Study heterogeneity is another metric of a meta-analysis. Simply put, study heterogeneity is the extent to which effect sizes vary within a meta-analysis. As you can see in this example, the effect sizes don't really vary that much between the studies, since they overlap quite a lot. Sure, they are not perfectly aligned, as we would expect to see some differences given that these are different studies. However, overall, there is little to no study heterogeneity, and this is also reflected in the statistical tests for study heterogeneity, since the p-value is greater than my alpha level of 0.05. On the other hand, if my forest plot looked something like this, then you can see that there is a large amount of study heterogeneity since the effect sizes are quite different between the included studies. There is a lot more to learn about study heterogeneity, so I'll save that for another video. So to wrap up, you can now see that the forest plot is complete again, and you should hopefully by now have a better understanding of what a forest plot is and how to interpret the results. If you found this video useful, please leave a like, it really does help support the channel. 
If you've got a question, pop it down in the comments below. Also, consider subscribing for more weekly tutorials.